Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Happy Thursday, everybody. It's really nice to have you here today, listening to The Last Symptom Podcast. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator of The Last Symptom, and the host of the show you're listening to now. Thank you for tuning in today. Because of various Last Symptom-related things, I'm a little backed up on my schedule. And today, I still had no show prepared for you folks, so needless to say... I was trying to get all my obligations out of the way so that I could get some quiet time to myself with my computer and not have any distractions, you know, so I could sit down and develop an outline for today's show. This episode of the show you're, you're actually listening to right this minute. So I very responsibly bided my time because I had all these other things to take care of And then when I did get all this other stuff taken care of, and I finally sat down to a nice, peaceful, quiet setting with my laptop to write the show you're about to hear, do you know what happened as soon as I sat down? It had been so peaceful and quiet in my neighborhood all day, (laughs) and yet as soon as I sat down, to write in peace. The peace and quiet suddenly erupted into the loudest, most annoying, grating sound of a motor that I've ever heard. My neighbor, a woman, choosing at just that precise moment to fire up her weed eater and begin weed eating a football field sized portion of property right next to my house. For those of you folks who don't know what a weed eater is, uh, it's like our lawnmower on a stick. <laughs> That's the best way I can describe it, I guess. A weed eater is like a lawnmower on a stick. So you got this pole you're holding, and it's got a trigger. It's got a motor on it. And at the end of that pole is a wire. And that wire spins very fast, just like a, a lawnmower blade. And you go around, and you we call it weed whacking. You whack all the weeds around trees and around buildings and and all stuff like that. So we call it weed eating or we call it weed whacking. Either one will do. But that's what happened. I just sat down to write this show and uh, all my peace and quiet that that I had been craving all day long to take advantage of to write this show just went poof right out the window when my neighbor started up her weed whacker and uh, the motor on this thing it's not quiet let's put it that way the thing sounds like it's coughing and dying and it, it, it kind of sounds like a Harley motorcycle without a muffler it's just it's just really loud it's not possible for you to understand just how <laughs> poetically painful this is that she was outside my window as I was trying to write this. Literally, all day long, I was thinking, gosh, it's such a beautiful, peaceful day for me to sit down and write. And I got the the show coming up that I got to record. And, uh, man, just the circumstances are ideal but I really got all this stuff I got to do first. So let me just take care of all this stuff first. And then I will have 
none of that on my back as I sit down in total peace to think out and write today's show. And so I do all this work. I get all this stuff out of the way. I finally get my computer. I sit down at my desk, so excited, so looking forward to the quiet and peace and the the mindset of being able to write today's show. And brrr, this lady kicks in with her uh, weed whacker. I sent a text to my friend saying, it, it's one of those things that's so ironic <laughs> that uh, literally as I'm sitting here at my computer, now you got to understand that the outline I'm reading from here right now <laughs> uh, happened earlier today, and I'm now recording this later in the day. But uh, here, the way I wrote this was that it's so ironic that she's out there with that weed whacker, that I'm now sitting here at my computer writing this, not knowing whether to be furious, to laugh hysterically, or to cry. <laughs> what in tarnation is she even doing home at this hour of the day? It defies explanation. Well, does that ever happen to you? The, the unlikelihood of something playing out just the way it does with such irony that you would swear you were in the Truman Show, you know, in that movie that had, uh, oh, what's his face, uh, Jim Carrey, come out like 20 years ago. Goodness gracious, as, as I was writing this, she was still out there with that doggone thing, creating as much noise as she possibly could. Unbelievable. The lady's timing really, really puts a hair in my biscuit. There have been other times over the summer when this same woman has fired up her lawnmower. <laughs> uh, and her, her lawnmower is no different. It, it has a motor that sounds like a, the jet engines of a 747. And she begins mowing grass. <laughs> that's, what, that's technically on her property, but it's right around the back of my studio. Just as I'm sitting down to record this show. After a whole day of trying to find time to record. <laughs> so this really is an ongoing issue. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to winter, to be honest with you, when I won't have to worry about her getting out her <laughs> mowers and weed whackers. Of course, then it'll probably be some industrial-sized snowblower that was made in the 1970s uh, that I'll have to contend with. But whatever, we'll, we'll deal with that as it comes. If any of you got a million dollars that you just want to give me, I promise that I will use it to build a sound studio that will just block out all noise. Uh, but until then, I guess you got to deal with uh, Norman the Cricket, who lives here with me inside my studio. Uh, I've got uh, Horace the Fly, who makes an appearance from time to time. Got my neighbor with the lawnmower. and uh, But, you know, still an improvement over the area that I was using to record in for the first uh, season and a half, first two seasons. Today, we're going to be talking about a topic that I've been wanting to get to for a long time now, and uh, I just haven't been able to get around to it. And uh, that topic is violators of boundaries. I'm not sure that as uh, I was writing this, I got it ironed out exactly the way I wanted to, but... Uh, you know, it's still going to be a good discussion. You know, if uh, there are things that I want to address later, ain't nobody stopping me. That's the good thing about this. We can go back and address the same topics as many times as we want. That's Isn't that nice? Now, before we get into the discussion of violators of boundaries, I just want to do a quick check with you to see how you're doing. You even though you have no way of answering me through your car speakers or wherever it is you are listening to me. I think it's nice to ask the question anyway because it sort of forces you to momentarily do, do a self-inventory. And it also 
let you know that you are not just some abstract, imaginary listener to me, but that I'm conscious of the fact that you, you are a real person and that I'm interested in you. Wherever you are and whatever you're up to at this moment, I hope you know that I personally hope you're doing well and staying positive and having confidence in the process of recovery. Although it's true that you and I and really nobody has control over what we feel, you know, uh, as it's just not a thing that human beings have uh, control over. We can't control what we feel. Remember that uh, we do have full control over our thoughts. That is to say, we have full control over whatever we choose to continue thinking about. Now, it's true that if I'm driving down the road and uh, I look up and I see a billboard, a billboard on the side of the road, it's an advertisement selling panties or bras or something like that. And they've got this, you know, half naked woman up on the billboard sitting around in her underwear. When I look up and see that, it's true that the initial thoughts I have might spontaneously jump up into my mind. That's true. But, you know, I'm not saying that, that we can always control what thoughts pop into our mind. What, I'm, what I have said to you is that we have full control over whatever we choose to continue thinking about. And I always make that distinction. You shouldn't underestimate that. That alone is powerful enough as it is. But think about this. This power that we possess goes beyond just what we choose to continue thinking about. We also have full control over how we choose to think about a thing. For example, I told you the story not too awful long ago about how I used to live life enjoying only one season out of the year. And, and this is a true story. And that season was summer. I used to love summer. And I used to really despise the other four, three seasons, spring, fall, and winter. At some point, and uh, this was even before my authentic recovery from borderline personality disorder, so I don't want you to think that you have to be completely emotionally healthy in order to possess this power and, um, and manage this power for yourself. So this is something that I personally did before I authentically recovered from borderline personality disorder. So, so it's something you can do too. But at some point, I realized that by living this way, only enjoying one season out of the year, at the end of my life, I would have only really lived fully one-fourth f- of my available lifespan. So, it was at that point, I decided to change the way I think about the seasons. I decided that uh, I was going to start thinking positively about all four seasons equally. And do you know what? It worked. For now years, I have honestly been able to say that I truly enjoy all four seasons of the year equally. All it required of me was to begin thinking of them positively. I'm on this health kick right now, uh, so I've been watching what I eat and counting calories and that sort of thing. The other day, I was having asparagus while I was with my daughter. She's five years old. Her name's Eloise. And I asked Eloise if she wanted some of my asparagus. And she said, Ew, no, I hate asparagus. And I said, 
sort of under my breath to myself. Well, all right, well, you're really missing out. Uh, but that's all right. You probably don't know that asparagus gives you a superpower. She says, what? It gives you what? I said, huh? She said, uh, did you say asparagus gives you a superpower? Yes, I said, but uh, you're probably not interested in knowing anything about that. Well, of course, uh, then she hassled me until I finally broke down. And uh, I told her, uh, maybe you don't know this, you listening, but uh, if you eat asparagus for about two minutes after you eat a single stalk of asparagus, you have super thinking abilities. Did you know that? She didn't know this either, but it's true. You eat a stalk of asparagus, and then for about two minutes, it grants you superpowers. Your brain will operate at a super enhanced level. Watch, I said. I'll show you. So I gobbled up a stalk of asparagus, and then I said, oh, oh yeah, I, I can feel it working already. Listen, uh, grass grows faster in the summertime than it does at any other times of the year. That's why you see so many people with mowers in the summertime. Holy mackerel, how did I not ever realize that before? Then I said, oh my goodness, I just realized something else. That the reason why there's so much desert on the west coast of the United States is because the sun sets in the west. At the end of each day, it drops down on all that area out there and scorches everything. <laughs> of course, that's why there's all that desert out there. I'm a genius. She said, say another one, say another one. And I said, I can't, I can't. It seems like that stalk of asparagus has worn off. I think I'll need to eat another one. Well, what do you think she wanted then? She wanted me to share half of my asparagus with her. And she ate every one of those asparagus, asparaguses, I guess is the way to say it. And after each one, after she ate each one, she said things like, Why, Daddy, it's so obvious. Why didn't I ever realize it before? The reason people get haircuts is because their hair is slowly getting longer all the time. And the reason trees aren't planted upside down is because roots aren't as pretty to look at as leaves and branches. I'm a genius, Daddy. And every few days or so, she will now express an interest in eating more, guess what, asparagus. What's this story tell you? That's a true story, by the way. But what's it tell you about the power that we as human beings possess to choose how we want to think about a thing? Not just what we choose to continue thinking about, but also how we will choose to think about it. And that brings me back to the lady outside my windows with the weed eater, making all the noise. She's still out there, but instead of choosing to think about the situation in a way that will make me furious, or in a way that will make me cry, or in a way that will make me laugh hysterically, I instead chose to think of the situation in a way that I could draw something constructive from. And that's what we've now done, you and I. Because we've managed to continue writing the script for this show all of the things I just finished sharing with you. <laughs> and do you know that I forgot that she and her ungodly noisemaker out there even exists? All the powers we possess as people, are you taking full advantage of them? 
Let me tell you about my website, thelastsymptom.com. It's full of free resources, free resources that uh, as soon as my schedule frees up a little bit, I'm going to be adding to. I hope you will take full advantage of what is there. There are also some paid resources at thelastsymptom.com, and I appreciate very much every person who takes advantage of them since they help support this work that I do. For example, if you're interested in a one-on-one phone conversation with me or a a one-on-one private Zoom meeting with me, people have been taking advantage of that. It's been really nice. Both of these things can be scheduled right at thelastsymptom.com. If you'd like to donate to support my overall body of work, which includes this podcast, you can do that right there at thelastsymptom.com. Oh, and one other thing I want to mention is that The Last Symptom official YouTube channel continues to grow in subscribers, which which, uh, makes me very happy. That channel offers me the ability to share some things Sometimes in a way that uh, I wouldn't otherwise be able to do easily. And one of the things I've done here in the past week, which is just kind of for fun, is that I have created a music playlist there of songs that have meaning for me. This was a, it was a fun thing for me to do because I haven't made a quote unquote mixtape. I don't even know if they are called that anymore. But I haven't made one for forever. And uh, to be honest with you, I think the last time I did one, the the last time I made a mixtape, it was for Janelle, my mistress. The one that I've told you about from the beginning of my road to recovery. You know, I miss her. I, I hope she's out there doing well. So it was a little bittersweet to create a list of music to share with others. It's, I haven't done that for a long, long time. It made me recall days past. So if you're interested in hearing some of the songs that I listen to, uh, the vast majority of them remind me of some aspect of my recovery or of uh, life before my recovery. Well, then you're welcome to check out that list of songs over at The Last Symptom official YouTube channel. Of course, for now, you'll just have to imagine why these songs have meaning to me. And maybe one day, over a milkshake, I'll get to tell you exactly what they mean to me and why. So you find The Last Symptom YouTube channel by searching for The Last Symptom in YouTube, or you can simply go over to thelastsymptom.com Scroll to the very bottom of the page, and there's a YouTube link down there. You just click on it. It takes you right to the channel. Once you're at the Last Symptom YouTube channel, click on Playlists, and you'll see one called Music with Meaning for Me. If you'll remember, back just a few months ago, I was celebrating the fact that we had reached 500 subscribers on the YouTube channel. Well, guess what? Now we're past 800 subscribers in just a short amount of time. So I want to thank all of you who have subscribed. I really appreciate it very much, and I hope subscribers just keep coming in. I'll keep trying to put on uh, content there that uh, that is interesting and informative and and that you might not be able to get anywhere else. One thing I've been working hard on, which I'm eager to make available to everybody, is the last symptom, Fundamentals Pre-Recorded Online Intensive Course. If you'd like to hear more details about that, just listen to the previous episode of this podcast where I spoke about various aspects of it. One thing I forgot to mention when I was discussing all the benefits of the pre-recorded course is this. If you're wondering what the difference is between this upcoming pre-recorded course and simply listening to these podcasts or talking to me on the phone, keep in mind that one of the greatest benefits that it offers and the difference between it 
and say this podcast or talking to me on the phone is structure. The fundamentals pre-recorded course provides a structure to the learning process that listening to the podcast or simply having a one-time phone cover conversation with me can't provide. So the course begins at the beginning, at the beginning of everything. It, it very naturally simplifies the whole development of your emotional disorder from the very beginning. It addresses every subtle, necessary thing in detail, and gradually the discussion evolves just very naturally over the course of a couple weeks so that concepts that might have gone right over your head before without this structure can be fully appreciated and digested. So look for an official announcement within just the next couple of weeks for when that course will be fully finished and available for your enrollment. I really do believe that it's going to form an imperative aspect of my work with people moving forward. Now let's get into our discussion about violators of boundaries. Do you recall what the two distorted core beliefs are of emotional disorder? Surely you do, if you've been listening to me for any length of time. The two distorted core beliefs of emotional disorder. So any person with any emotional disorder, not just borderline personality disorder, but any person with an emotional disorder is operating with fundamental misperceptions about the nature of feelings, self, and life. And it starts like this. Number one, my feelings are inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of inherent worth. And number two, I myself am also inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of inherent worth. Because these are the foundation of emotional disorders. They become the figurative colored lenses that unhealthy people use to look out at the world. Imagine putting on a pair of glasses that have uh, purple colored lenses. What would you see? What would you see walking around with this pair of sunglasses on that have purple colored lenses? Well, everything you see and every interaction you have with life has to pass through what? Has to pass through the, the filter, right, of those lenses that are distorting what you're really seeing. So folks with emotional disorders are working on a subtle but powerfully false premise from the very bottom ground up. And that's the two distorted core beliefs we just talked about. My feelings are inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of inherent worth. And I'm inherently irrelevant and shameful, devoid of inherent worth. Now, because people are walking around filtering everything through these lenses, we can say that folks with emotional disorders live with inaccurate, false perceptions regarding the nature of feelings, self, and life. When we say that unhealthy people walk around with an erroneous understanding of feelings, we're not just talking about your feelings. By extension, we're talking about feelings in general. That is, all people's feelings. And when we say self, we're not just talking about your self, but by extension, selves. That is to say, the very nature of what it means to be a person the very nature of what it is to be a human being. How do we, as human beings, first acquire or adopt these two distorted core beliefs about our feelings and ourselves, the nature of feelings and ourselves, I should say, in the first place? Is it from instances of trauma? Well, as many times as that 
misdirection has been drilled into your head by people walking around calling themselves experts, the answer is no. Trauma, quote unquote, has very little to do with anything. What is the real value in studying certain dramatic, impressionable moments in our lives that some call traumatic? Well, I'll tell you, the only real value in doing this is that by it does have value, I should say that first. It, it really does have value, but not for the reasons you might think. The only real value in doing this is that by studying these individual experiences, we can then deduce the attitudes that our unhealthy emotional teachers lived with that allowed them to do what they did in those individual, dramatic, memorable instances. Now, pay attention to that. I've just told you that the real origin of your problems has never been trauma, but that it instead has always been what? Attitudes unhealthy attitudes that your parents live with. Hopefully, you can see why that is so relevant to understanding the true nature of your emotional disorder and how it got there. No, that one time your parents humiliated you in front of all your friends is not the origin of your problems. Yes, it was dramatic. Yes, it did leave an impression. But that experience in itself is not the origin of your problems. Rather, the origin of your problems is the attitudes that allowed your parents to believe that humiliating their child in front of others was okay. Why is this distinction so important? Am, am I just splitting hairs? Well, no, I, I'm not just splitting hairs. Authentic recovery requires, it requires that you make this distinction and that you understand the importance of the distinction. Do you see that because your parents' unhealthy attitudes are the real origin of your problems, the very nature of how your problems originated was not an individual, dramatic, isolated, traumatic, quote-unquote, experiences. Rather, because your parents live with these attitudes, did they only live with those attitudes in these dramatic moments? No, they live with these attitudes all the time, all the time, you were being exposed to these same attitudes, these same types of thinking, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all year long, for years and years and years. Do you see that? When you were sitting at breakfast eating cereal, you were being emotionally abused by these same attitudes. When you were getting ready for school in the morning, all those years that you can't even remember, they didn't even leave an impression, the same damage was happening in those moments as well. Not just when you were being humiliated in front of your friends. Do you see that? When you inappropriately look at single experiences as being more relevant than they really are, and you parrot the professional community as a group and say, it was trauma that caused all this. What you're doing is completely misunderstanding the true nature of the origins of your issues. This did not come from five or six or ten or forty uh, dramatic moments in your memory. This came from all the stuff that was happening in between. It was happening all the time. It was your exposure 
your constant exposure to these unhealthy underlying attitudes that your parents lived with. Again, the only value in these dramatic or quote-unquote traumatic experiences, if you're just dead set on parroting that word that the professional community has programmed you to, re- to repeat, the only value that these instances in our memories have is that we can analyze them and we can draw obvious conclusions about what sorts of attitudes our parents had to have lived with that allowed them to behave that way at all or to talk to us that way at all or to treat us that way at all or to neglect us that way at all. If your parents live with those attitudes back then, then guess what? Unless they're doing the same work that you're doing right now to identify these underlying misperceptions toward life and correct them, your parents are still living with those same attitudes. Our foundation attitudes toward the nature of fundamental aspects of life do not ever change on their own. Not ever. In other words, just because your father is now 50 years older than he was back then, if he hasn't done any of the work to specifically identify and change those foundation attitudes, his age is not relevant at a hall. His age has not changed those attitudes one single bit. Those are still the underlying attitudes that he lives with if he's still living. When dealing with a person who pays no attention to your boundaries, it's important to ask yourself, what attitudes are at the root of all this? Also, it's important to make a contrast. So, for people who do respect boundaries, what attitudes are at the root of all that? Let's look at a boundary situation, and uh, you can help me analyze the way an unhealthy person responds to that situation in the interest of seeing clearly what obvious truths about their underlying attitude this has to reflect. I call this the law of genuine attitude reflection. The law of genuine attitude reflection. I don't know if anybody out there has got a, a different name for it, but that's what I call it. The law of genuine attitude reflection. And basically, this law states that the way you naturally behave toward a thing cannot contradict whatever your true underlying attitude is that you live with in relation to that thing. So, for example, if I scream and and I run and hide every time there's lightning you know, lightning bolts and thunder outside. What can we be absolutely certain is the attitude I live with in regards to lightning? Is my attitude that lightning is absolutely harmless? Absolutely not, right? We, we don't have to be rocket scientists to analyze these consistent behaviors and draw accurate conclusions about what my true attitude toward lightning is. Clearly, I live with the underlying attitude that lightning is deadly. That's the law of genuine attitude reflection. How about if I consistently go around kicking and mistreating dogs? But here's the catch. At the same time, I regularly tell people how great dogs are and how much they should be cared for. 
So what attitude is being reflected in that situation? Would you say that uh, my attitude must be that I really do view dogs as something of great value? Well, clearly not. You see, it doesn't matter what I say to people. It doesn't ma- My words don't matter. Because my behaviors betray what my true attitude toward dogs are that I live with, don't they? So what is the attitude I have to, I clearly live with? Well, I clearly live with the attitude that dogs can be treated any old way, that they're like inanimate possessions that I can mistreat. That's how much value they have. They have as much value as uh, this old chair that I'm sitting in. It's mine, right? I can treat it however I want. As a bonus point, uh, can you figure out anything else reflected in the attitude in this example? So I consistently go around kicking and mistreating dogs, but at the same time, I regularly tell people, how great dogs are, and uh, how much, how they just, they deserve to be treated well. (laughs) Do you see that another obvious and accurate conclusion can be drawn here uh, in this example as far as uh, what attitude I just must live with? And that's that I, I just must live with the attitude that saying a thing carries more value than actually living in harmony with what I say, right? It's so obvious. It's so obvious. It's undeniable. If if I'm always telling people that dogs deserve to be treated well, but at the same time, I'm consistently going around mistreating them, abusing them, and kicking them, What attitude must I be living with? That saying a thing carries more value than actually living in harmony with what I say. That is the law of genuine attitude reflection. We can claim our attitudes are absolutely anything at all, but our natural behaviors always tell the truth. Our natural behaviors always perfectly reflect whatever true underlying attitudes we live with. Now, I say that the, the law of genuine attitude reflection applies to our natural behaviors. And the reason why I say it that way is because anybody can force themselves to temporarily behave in ways that contradict their true attitudes. But this isn't their natural behaviors, is it? Those are forced behaviors, and they cannot be maintained. Sooner or later, a person's natural behaviors will still win the day, and they will reveal the true underlying attitudes that any person lives with. The law of genuine attitude reflection. But back to the folks who regularly ignore boundaries. What sorts of attitudes are reflected in this consistent ignoring of boundaries? Well, maybe we need some examples. In my personal circumstances, the boundary I've created in regards to my father is that he and I Unfortunately, cannot have any contact, any communication, or any relationship at all for the time being. Now, if you'll remember back in uh, Season 2, Episode 45 of this podcast, we had a really important conversation about the BCCCs of emotional health. Do, Do you remember what the BCCCs stands for? It's important to keep those in mind because they give you the only healthy template for living with boundaries. So if you're a little hazy on the details, it might be worth your time to go back and re-listen to Season 2, Episode 45 of this podcast once we've finished up here. 
The BCCCs of emotional health stand for boundaries, communication, consequences, and finally, conditions. Boundaries, communication, consequences, and conditions. So we create boundaries around ourselves. Not around others, but around ourselves. Which we then always clearly communicate. We say, here's the line around me. And these are the sorts of things that I will not tolerate. And here are the sorts of things I I do tolerate. Then we communicate non-negotiable consequences that will absolutely without fail occur when somebody ignores the boundary which we have communicated. But what does the last C stand for? That one stands for conditions. So this is a love and provision that we can provide for those who we would like to have in our life who may not qualify currently but that we care for and would like to see them healthfully be allowed to be a part of our lives. Conditions are simply the qualifications that we communicate to them that they can meet in order to re-qualify to be back in our lives again. This is why I say that my dad and I can't have any contact, communication, or relationship for the time being. Because, you see, I'm hopeful were he to meet the very simple conditions that I have communicated to him, there would exist no reason for there to be any restrictions like this whatsoever. But he simply has not chosen for himself to meet those very simple, reasonable conditions. So one day, and this is a true story, I'm coming out of a store, and there's my dad, He's standing near the entrance, talking to a mutual friend of ours. This is a story I've told in the past in an episode of this show. And as you know, if you heard that past episode, as I went to leave the store, my dad took it upon himself to try to talk to me. Very uncomfortable situation. In the original episode, when I described this encounter, I explained how this was not a simple momentary act of sweetness on his part. You see, he's very, very aware of my boundary and of the conditions that he has to meet in order for him to be permitted to do such a thing like that. He knows very well that he and I are not to have any direct communication together as long as he has not met the conditions necessary for that. And the conditions we're talking about are not anything, you know, extreme or unreasonable. Basically, I've asked him to uh, be seeing a therapist. And I've communicated to him that this needs to be regular, regularly. Man, I struggle with that word. Regularly, but... You know, I have explained to him that that he can he can determine for himself how regular uh, those visits with a therapist are going to be. It can be once a month. It can be once a week. It can be once every three months. It can be three times a year. The only thing I need to see is him doing it regularly. Does that seem too extreme to you? <laughs> no. This is something that. He could so easily, this is a condition that he could so easily meet, but that would demonstrate to me real remorse on his part. First of all, it would demonstrate that he accepts his role in my emotional disorder and also in the, the abuse of my siblings and of my mother. And that he feels some remorse for it. So, great big payoffs, very little cost on his part. And yet, he will not do it. He will not do it. He knows he's not done this. And here he sees me, and he says, I'm going to talk to him, even knowing what my boundary regarding 
communication between the two of us is. He decides that it's okay. He's going to do it anyway. So he very blatantly ignored my boundary. Now, let me ask you this question. Does it matter if one of your boundaries makes sense to somebody else? So, in other words, do emotionally healthy people observe other people's boundaries only when those boundaries are boundaries that they personally agree with? Well, that would sort of undermine the whole reason that boundaries exist, wouldn't it? Can you imagine a man and a woman, they're making out, they're about to get physically intimate, and the woman says, okay, okay, that's, that's enough. Please let me up now. And can you imagine the man thinking, eh, she doesn't really mean it, or eh, I know better than she does. Are, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? When this has happened to me in the past, and it has, if a woman has said so much as, wait, believe me, believe me, I ain't taking any chances there whatsoever, brother. I'm not only going to wait, <laughs> but I'm going to back off, let up, Check to see how she's feeling. If she needs a glass of water, do I need to leave? Do I need to brush my teeth? Just what? What? You tell me anything, and I'm doing it. I'm doing exactly that and beyond that. And the last thing on earth that I'm going to do is give off any sort of vibe that I'm arguing with you about what it is you really want or ignoring some sort of boundary that involves your own body, which I have no right to at all. And the only reason that I'm getting to enjoy this experience with you at all is because you personally want it yourself and are agreeing to it. Trust me, the moment that's called into question, I am not arguing the point. Guys, you are aware of what sort of climate we're living in these days, right? Well, even if we weren't living in that climate, you know, the fact is uh, that that is the appropriate way to respond to that. If a woman says wait or no or, oh, hang on, let me up for a second. You don't say, are you sure? You say, okay, and you get up. <laughs> That's just all there is to that. So... The climate we're in today does not uh, allow for much forgiveness or leeway on this matter. So if you aren't aware of the climate we're living in these days, guys, get aware. Now, naturally, the sort of immediate response to show respect for what another person wants or doesn't want in regards to their own body should work both ways. But uh, I've yet to hear of a woman going to prison for continuing to kiss a guy who has asked her not to. So, you know, it, it just is what it is. But hopefully you get the point that that is the way boundaries work. You, as a person, have full inherent rights, responsibility, and authority over yourself. What does it mean when you've made a decision for yourself, you've plainly communicated it to another person, and they totally disregard it. As in the story of my dad, knowing full well my boundary, but utterly ignoring it. Or, in the illustration I just told you about making out with a lover, and her telling you to stop and not go further. Do you see that there's really not any difference between the illustration of the lover and the experience with my father? In both cases, the very nature, the very fundamental nature of the, of the violation is the same. The same type of attitude is given birth to both violations. Well, remember what it is we're doing today. 
we're analyzing these things to determine exactly what the underlying unhealthy attitudes are that people are living with who disregard other people's boundaries. Well, in the case of my dad, here's one. I'm not an individual. Do you see that? I'm not an individual. I'm a belonging of his. See, he he's my father, and I'm his son, and I will always be his son. So technically, from my father's perspective, I'm a belonging. I'm not a person. And what can you do with your belongings? Well, you can do anything you want with your belongings, can't you? That's right. Nobody can tell you what to do with your belongings. See, this is the attitude you and I and everybody appropriately has about your personal laptop, your personal cell phone, your personal car. If some person just walks up to you on the street, let's say one of your neighbors down the road, and she tries to create some sort of limitation or expectation on how you must treat your personal cell phone, what would you say to her? (laughs) Well, I can only imagine, I can only imagine the word combinations that would escape from your mouth, probably before you even realized you were saying them. But let me ask you this, uh, in all seriousness. Would you feel obligated in any way whatsoever to observe the limitations or expectations that somebody puts on your personal cell phone? Of course you wouldn't. You would absolutely tell that person to get out of your face and to get lost. Your attitude, and rightfully so, when we're talking about your cell phone, would be that it doesn't matter whatsoever how anybody else wants you to use your phone or how they think you should use it or how often they think you should use it. They have absolutely no authority whatsoever over how you use your, th- your phone and how dare they, how dare they walk up to you with those sorts of expectations, thinking that they have some kind of authority over how you use your phone. What is the only reason you would let a person put such limitations or expectations on how you use a phone? You would only permit that if you did not perceive the phone as belonging to you, right? So back to my father, I tell him, I'm making this decision for myself. I would like you to respect it. What are the only two possibilities? Here they are. Number one, his attitude is that I'm an individual. Well, then clearly he views me as belonging only to who? To myself. I can make absolutely any decision for myself that I like, whether he agrees with it or not. And if this is the real attitude he lives with, what does the law of genuine attitude reflection say must be his behavior as a result? Well, if that's truly his attitude, then he would naturally observe the boundary, wouldn't he? If he consistently observes the boundary even though he doesn't like that I've created it, it can only mean that he lives with the attitude that I am an individual. I'm an individual, adult, free agent. And as such, I have the right to make such decisions for myself, the same as he has the right to make any decisions for his life that he feels are necessary, right? So that's number one. Here's the second possibility. The second possibility is that his attitude is that I am not an individual. You see, I'm an extension of him. In other words, I'm partially his property. 
and as his property, he is not beholden in any way to respect or observe any boundaries I create. Remember the cell phone example. I want to give you folks a few more examples of violators of boundaries, and these are not to embarrass anybody. And if you think any of these examples involve you personally, I can almost guarantee they absolutely do not. But, you know, every time I share real examples, I end up getting 100 emails of people apologizing to me or uh, asking if I was talking about them personally. Listen to me closely. I'm not talking about you personally. And even if I were, it doesn't matter. The whole point of me sharing a real example but not giving you any idea of who the story is about is that I respect every single person and I don't want any any person to feel singled out or to unnecessarily beat themselves up about something that really um, I'm not beating you up about. If you simply do a self-examination and if you find that uh, any of these things apply to you, well, then, you, you know, you can make some adjustments moving forward. And, and then the story has served a constructive purpose, and there's absolutely no reason to shame yourself about it. Actually, there's never a reason to shame yourself, ever. What I mean is that if my reasons for sharing true experiences here are valued in the, in the way that they're intended... If you understand my true purpose for sharing them, and it helps you make adjustments in perspective and understand it about things moving forward, then, then what does it matter if the story involved you personally or not? I, the idea is to understand that I don't dislike you. You understand that? I, I don't dislike you. I do like you. It's the only reason I do this show every week at all. It's meant to help you in your own work. So when it serves that purpose, which is the reason why I share anything I share, the proper perspective to have is not anything negative, but rather only the positive. Okay, so first example. Somebody finds me on WhatsApp, and they ask me a few questions, which I answer. After this attention... The person begins sending me pages upon pages of messages. I'm not kidding. I checked my phone one day, and there were over 70, over 70 new messages from this person. Well, I never read the, those messages or even responded to them. Why not? Because I never agreed to those conversations in the first place. They were thrust upon me with no regard for my time or my willingness. Now, eventually, I felt compassion for this person. And this is after a period of months. And I eventually had a conversation with this person where I explained to him, uh, well, he, you know, he asked me if I'd been reading those messages, and I, I explained to him that I had not. And I very pointedly told this person that I won't read any of his future messages on WhatsApp. I explained to him clearly that there is an appropriate way to reach out to me when he wants questions answered, and I explained to him precisely the appropriate way and the appropriate platform on which to do that. Does he respect my boundary? Well, you already know the answer to that. After a short period of time, he totally disregarded any notion of a boundary, and again, I began getting loads and loads of messages from him again on WhatsApp. All conversations that he is having with himself because I'm not reading them, <laughs> and I've explained to him that I'm not, I'm not reading them. Journaling would have been more constructive, and it would have also simultaneously showed respect for the boundary that I clearly communicated to him. So eventually what I did is I just blocked this person. It's not what I wanted to do. But, um, yeah, it was definitely warranted. Your total lack of respect for me 
will earn you what? Yeah, it'll earn you total lack of respect from me. It's just the way that works. Using the law of genuine attitude reflection as a guide, what underlying attitudes is the person in the example I just gave you living with? Let me ask you this. Does the person have an accurate underlying perspective about the nature of self? Remember, this doesn't only apply to the perspective he has about his own self, but do you remember that by extension, it involves his perspective of all selves, that is to say people, the nature of what it is to be a human being, their value or lack of value. The inherent rights and respect and consideration that human beings deserve, rightfully expect and deserve. Well, I'm not going to entirely answer the question for you. This is an exercise I'd like you to walk away from this program working on. Using the law of genuine attitude reflection, which says that a person's natural behaviors cannot contradict whatever underlying attitude they truly live with regarding something and vice versa. In other words, their behaviors never contradict their underlying attitudes, and their underlying attitudes never contradicts their consistent behaviors. So, using the law of genuine attitude reflection, what underlying attitudes would you say that this person, in this example I just gave you, lives with? I've helped you identify one. His inappropriate, distorted view of himself and other people, right? His inappropriate, distorted view of people, himself included. You see, he doesn't view people as people. He doesn't view people accurately as people must be viewed in order for those views to be accurate and healthy. If he did, the way that he treated me, the way he behaved around me and behaved and um, viewed my time and everything and my energy and uh, my, my boundaries, you know, when I, when I communicate to him, the appropriate way to reach out to me, and he totally disregards that, then he's crossing a boundary. I have to, I have to then enforce a consequence. And the, the consequences I've already mentioned, it was, it was a total block. Uh, and who's responsible for that? Not me. Not me. Here's another one. Back when I first created my Facebook education group, I created a list of concrete rules that had to be followed. And one of them was that no outside links could be used within my last symptom group. Now, why did I create this rule? Is it because I want to brainwash people? Or maybe this one. Maybe it's because I'm jealous that some outside personality could steal my thunder. Maybe it's that one. The real reason why that rule exists in my Facebook education group is that I don't have time to verify outside sources of information for accuracy. My Facebook education group, in fact, my entire body of work, is designed to be a refuge from conflicting and erroneous information. So in the interest of all members of my group, I don't allow outside links because in order to keep my group free from conflicting and inaccurate information, while at the same time allowing people to post links to outside information that I know nothing about, that would oblige me to personally follow every one of those links and watch hours of videos and read hours of article and do hours of research on these personalities to know for a fact that what they're teaching is in harmony with what I know to be true. I don't have any interest in that or time to do that. But no, 
my pride has nothing whatsoever to do with that rule. Uh, in fact, I was just talking to uh, somebody on the phone today. She says, do you know this author? I said, no, I don't. She said, well, this author says this and this and this. And uh, as she was telling me that, I was thinking, well, that author is dead on. That author has just hit the nail on the head. And I felt great pride for whoever that author is. I don't even remember her name. But I said, this lady has got it. She, she just nailed it. And I was happy to know that there's somebody out, else out there like me providing people with accurate information. In no way did that woman give me that story, and in no way did I feel jealous or uh, envious or feel like, hey, why, why are you listening to me and her? I didn't feel that way at all. What I felt was excitement, happiness, that there's somebody else out there who uh, is an author and is clearly providing people the same information that I'm providing you, the same type of insights, uh, maybe in a different way. But, you know, the, the information, the insight that uh, this person that I was talking to on the phone shared with me, it was just dead on. And so, no, ego has nothing to do with, with the rule in my group. To this day, if a person ignores this particular Facebook group rule, which is about not sharing outside links, it results in an immediate ban from the group. No warnings, just an immediate ban. So am I being unreasonable or mean? Well, first of all, such people still have access to this weekly podcast. They still have access to my website and all the resources I provide there. Really, the only thing they're getting cut off from is the Facebook group itself. So as extreme as a ban may seem, it's really not as extreme as some would like to make it out to be. You know, because anybody who gets banned from the group, if they're truly interested in their recovery, they still have all of the last symptom tools they need to, to help with that, it, except for one, which is just the Facebook education group. And yes, it is a tremendously valuable resource, but my unwillingness to bend on that issue is a boundary. It's a boundary. When people ignore the boundary, am I doing them any favors whatsoever by then not following through with a consequence? No, I'm not. And I refuse to be an enabler, a participant in something that allows them to remain emotionally unhealthy. So, though it may seem extreme to some, it's done out of true interest for their emotional health and their recovery. Let me ask you, when a person comes into a new group and they expect somebody else to lead them by the hand, to read the rules, understand the rules, and observe the rules of that group, Using the law of genuine attitude reflection, what can we accurately deduce must be the underlying attitudes they live with that are given birth to this. Well, how about this? That it is other people who are responsible for them. See, they aren't responsible for themselves. They're always victims of some injustice or misunderstanding, aren't they? If only somebody had reminded them of the rule ten times or had encouraged them more to look up what the rules of the group are, then they would have known better, right? Do you see that uh, this is the way children think, by the way? The difference is that children are dependent on adults, they truly are dependent on adults. So it is appropriate for children to live with this attitude. Is it ever appropriate for an adult, any adult, to live with the attitude that other people 
are responsible for your life, your decisions, your failures. No, it's not. That's not appropriate. It's not mature. It's childish. It's, it's stunted. How about the failure to follow directions, which is another form of boundary breaking? Because it says, okay, this is the way you want things done, but uh, I know better. I'm going, to, I'm going to do it my own way anyway, because the way you want it done is not really that important. I'm going to do it my way. On my website, one of the questions you must fill out in order to schedule an appointment with me is what country your telephone is registered to. Now, why do you reckon I ask that question? I ask that question because if a person is international, then I know not to call them with my regular phone service, but to instead use WhatsApp in order to save us both from any possible charges. So did you catch what the question is that people have to answer in order to schedule appointments with me? The question is, what country country is your phone registered to? Do you know how often I get people who type in things like North America as the answer? Is North America a country? Even my daughter, who is five years old, knows that North America is a continent. It's not a country. So does the answer North America do anything whatsoever to answer my question about what country, country, your phone is registered to? No, it doesn't. So here's another exercise for you. Using the law of genuine attitude reflection, what sort of unhealthy attitude must the people who choose to ignore this boundary by answering the question in their own way, regardless of the answer they know I'm looking for, reflect? Well, for one, that if something does not make sense to them, then that thing is irrelevant, right? There's no reason in viewing it with any importance if it's it's irrelevant from their point of view. How many of these folks do you think also view their children's feelings that same way? In other words, what you're feeling right now doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Therefore, what you're feeling is irrelevant. Again, I'll let you further flush out some more attitude insights from this particular example as well as from the other examples. On my website, there's an option for you to sponsor phone conversations for others who are in financial difficulty. This is already being abused. I'm sad to say. In what way? Well, on the website where this option is available, it specifically states that you sponsor the cost, and that's where your part ends. It's Brian Barnett, in other words, me, not you, who will apply the sponsored call to the person of my choosing, not of your choosing. Now, I'm extremely grateful that in the vast majority of These cases, when folks have taken advantage of this feature, they've done so with great trust that I will indeed apply the value of that phone call to somebody who can genuinely use it, and they leave it to me. But lately, some of the sponsored funds coming in have come with additional instructions from the benefactors, directing me to apply the sponsored call to specific people that they are involved with. Does this demonstrate respect for me or for the arrangement, the sponsored phone phone call arrangements, arrangement that I have set up? No, it doesn't. 
Why don't I want you sponsoring a phone call and then being able to influence who I will apply that sponsored call to? Because I will not support you being an enabler for somebody who is unhealthy. What is the only condition that makes recovery work at all? Isn't it that a person self-initiates and does the work because they themselves want it? If you are making the appointment with me for somebody else and you are paying for that call, and then you are obligating me to talk to somebody who has never demonstrated any self-initiation whatsoever to take an interest in my work, and they have not so much as even taken advantage of the free resources that are already out there and available to them that I provide, why on earth would I want to support you supporting their emotional unhealth by enabling their helplessness and reliance on everybody else to solve their problems. I won't do that. Now think about this. Should I have to explain any of my reasons for any of these things before people show me respect for my work and do things in the proper way? No, and that's not the reason why I'm explaining these things here. I'm explaining them to illustrate how for every little thing, I have good reasons in the interest of your authentic recovery for doing things the way I do them. But your willingness to observe my boundaries, that is, the acceptable ways to interact with me as opposed to the unacceptable ways, is not dependent on you first understanding or agreeing with my reasons for the way I have things set up. If you value me, if you value my work, if you view me as a person, and if you understand what being a person means, again, for people who ignore the explanation on my website for how sponsored phone calls work, what are the underlying attitudes? that they must be living with that explains this behavior. We've already identified one, right? They're unhealthy enablers. So other people aren't responsible for themselves. So their attitude is that these other human beings are not adults with the same responsibilities, the same inherent responsibilities that we all live with. Instead, they're like little children, They have to be babied. Not only that, but the the sponsor has rights, responsibility, and authority over some other adult human being, right? This has to be the underlying attitude because why else would one adult assume the responsibility over another independent adult free agent's recovery? You don't have your own shit to occupy your time and attention with and get and get fixed. The law of genuine attitude reflection doesn't lie. Notice, this is a great difference over sponsoring a call and not knowing who it will be applied to. What attitude does that reflect? Well, it, it reflects the attitude that uh, you want to give back and help those in need, totally selflessly, right? Because you don't know who it will be applied to at all. You have no dog in the race. You simply know that somebody out there can use it, and you want to help. Much, much different than sponsoring a call and then including instructions for who that sponsored call must specifically be applied to. And likewise, for those in need who receive money from um, somebody who cares about them, and then they reach out to me. You know, the person who is interested in, in talking to me finds the funds from somebody else who cares about them, and then they, they turn around and they use those funds to make an appointment with me. Again, that's totally different than the, vi- the violators of boundaries that I'm talking about. 
because that person is self-initiating. You know, they're demonstrating a genuine interest, self-initiating, reaching out to me on their own. Yes, the money come from somebody else, but that's all right. The effort that's going into it is still originating with them, and that makes all the difference. That's to be applauded. So we've talked about several examples here. You know, I don't want to beat up on everybody, but um, a couple more I got here. You know, people choosing their own acceptable ways to approach things and, um, you know, kind of disregarding things that I have specified. Uh, People making appointments with me where I specifically state that I will call them at the appropriate time. But, you know, two minutes before the scheduled phone call, my phone's ringing. And that's not the way that I've detailed how um, uh, appointments with me are to work. Uh, It states very clearly on the website that I will call you at the appropriate time. So, you know, this is a conversation where you can spend a lot of time thinking about this. The idea is to give you um, something to think about moving forward in your own life where you're dealing with people who are violators of boundaries or maybe you're the violator of boundaries. Either way, I hope you know that even though some of this may have sounded like I was angry or that I was complaining or that I was getting, you know, giving people the third degree, uh, that was not the point of any of it. Uh, Yes, some of those things are frustrated. Yes, I do have to uh, apply concrete consequences in some cases. Um, And I do have boundaries set up. Um, I'm not trying to discourage anybody. My whole shtick is positivity, you know, and, and not like magical positivity. Not like, well, if you just think positive, think, you know, everything will work out fine. No, you still got to do hard work. But just like we said at the beginning of this program, there's a lot of things that uh, we have this superpower to choose how we will decide to think about a thing. And so there's two ways you could go about thinking about this episode of the podcast. You could think about it very negatively, and that's not my intention for you at all. Of course, I have no control over what you ultimately decide (laughs) how you ultimately decide to think about this episode. But let me say this. My intention at no time is to discourage you. But when we're talking about serious things, my intention is to reflect the seriousness of that discussion. And that's what I was trying to do here. At the same time, I want you to be encouraged that uh, your ability, your capability to begin putting an emphasis on how you view boundaries. You know, rules are just boundaries. Depends a lot just on you, on the way that you uh, choose to think about these things. And if nobody ever brought these things up, well then, you know, how would you ever begin to understand the subtle ways that you've been viewing these things incorrectly? So two possibilities today. One possibility which is very constructive, is that now you can go out into your own life and you can observe when other people are violating your boundaries and you can begin to to do this analysis about what those underlying attitudes might be that are given birth to these violations. And then the other very constructive possibility is that you listen to this episode with yourself in mind and you think, I've done that. I've done things like that. Now, uh, after that, is the next step just to, to wallow in shame or to beat yourself up or to, to really uh, dislike yourself for these things? Not at all. Not at all. The next step is to say, fine, <laughs> clearly I'm not the first one. By the way, you're not the first one. I, Brian Barnett lived 35 years doing these same things. That's that's why I know them so well. All right? I did the same things. So in no way am I 
you know, just, uh, just attacking you and considering you just like a lost cause or anything like that. Not at all. I did these same things. That's why I understand them. Because at some point, I had to go from that to beginning to uh, live with boundaries. Not just for myself, but acknowledging other people's boundaries and respecting them. And beginning to view people as people <clears throat> who have a right to determine how they the, the sort of treatment that they will accept, the sort of interactions they will accept, in what format they will accept them, um, and all these sorts of things. So I hope that this episode does you a lot of good. You know, it's going to be out there for a hundred trillion years, and uh, just a lot of good things to to digest there. Again, a lot of serious stuff that I hope you won't take too personally. Just take it as a constructive thing to learn from, and and uh, that will satisfy me very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Brian Barnett with The Last Symptom. I'm so glad that you've been here with me today. I'm wrapping up the show now. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And as always, thanks for listening Go out and do something really nice for yourself this weekend. Because um, if I were there with you, I would do something nice for you. And you should be willing to do something nice for yourself, too. Mm-hmm.